warm welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Ilko Bos van Rosenthal. I'll be the moderator of our um, interview tonight. We have one interview and one guest, but it's a very special one, um, especially in these uh, extraordinary times. Galina Timchenko yep. is here. She found time in her busy schedule uh, to be with us. She is the um, founder, the co-founder and the CEO and the publisher of Medusa, which is the largest independent um, Russian, Russian media outlet still reporting on the war in Ukraine. And she is also, she was voted the European Journalist of the Year 2022. For that reason and for her being here, please give her a warm applause. Galina Timchenko. Thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Um, we worked on your Dutch during dinner just a little bit. Yeah. Um, it was good, <laughs> but not good <laughs> enough, so we'll taste. continue yeah. in English. Um, we'll talk uh, about how Medusa was founded, yeah. obviously, uh, and how the past eight years have been for you and for, for Medusa. Um, but let's first talk about the present, obviously, the, the, the war in Ukraine and how Medusa has been doing since... February 24, mm -hmm. which is the day that the war uh, war began. Can you take us back to that day? Did you know, as a person, as a journalist, um, that the invasion was inevitable? Uh, you know, uh, you may call me. Uh, you may call uh, um, myself. Uh, um, <laughs> maybe, maybe a, a person. Uh, who could predict uh, future, but uh, uh, one year ago, Medusa was labeled as a foreign agent by Russian authorities. Mm -hmm. So we started to develop uh, what we call disaster scenarios. We have this bad habit every three months, me and my co-founder, editor-in-chief of Medusa, we uh, conducted a meeting and uh, Mm, we made these disaster scenarios. And uh, we are talking about n possible next steps of Russian government against us. And in one moment I said, Ivan, just stop. Please, let's think about it. We were the first foreign uh, agent. We were labeled as a foreign agent, we were number the first, number first. Uh, it was in April 21, It was right? in, so in, in, in April. Almost a year but before the war. But then they started to add <coughs> media and into the black list. Uh, they put it, put almost all independent media in that list. What's the reason? And I said, let's pretend that I'm Putin. What for? Even the smallest niche media were put into this blacklist. And I said, if I were Putin and if I was thinking about the war, I do not need a single independent voice. Then I will silence everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I were Putin, I definitely would need the only one voice, propaganda. So the war is here. And you realize that, so you're saying but in hindsight, eight months before the war started, you yeah, were yeah, labeled but a foreign agent. Yeah. Did you realize at the yeah, time what you yeah, just said? Yeah. Yeah. But actually, I, did, I could not imagine that it could be a full scale invasion. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be next military conflict around Donbass. Mm -hmm. like Maybe everybody. around. Mariupol, because they definitely need the way to the sea. Mm -hmm. So I could not imagine the full-scale invasion. And this day, uh, you know, me and my co-founder, we call each other 24 hours, so without um, any doubt. So, and we have some kind of password. When he called me at midnight, he said, don't, don't be afraid, it's not a war. I just want to check this uh, topic. Or I called him and said, Ivan, please do not be afraid, it's not a war. And at 24th of February at 4 a.m., he called me. And, and I take my phone and he said, wake up, it's a war. Mm -hmm. What were, were just, your first thoughts? <laughs> uh, I feel myself like a person who is locked in 
ice cage. And uh, since 24, 4th of February, we started work 24-7. We were not prepared for such kind of work. Uh, and it, <coughs> it was a marathon. <laughs> it was tough. Mm. And I cried every day. Because it's something you cannot prepare for as a, as a news no. organization. No, but, but you had to adjust? Absolutely, absolutely. So what did you do after February 24th? Uh, uh, actually, uh, first we refused uh, uh, to take part in any conferences because we were exhausted and we work from 16 up to 20 hours a day mm -hmm. uh, covering the war. Second, we started to negotiate with the Ukrainian government to obtain uh, permission to go to the ward for our journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, then we uh, started to publish uh, this uh, um, live reporting from the war field mm -hmm. uh, called the Medusa's Online every day. And since uh, 24th of February, we have now... 294th online <laughs> every day without days off. So it was exhausting. And the, 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 the toughest part was that you are under double pressure. You are like a, a traitor <laughs> in the eyes of your country. Mm -hmm. And you are... A, Ah, uh, unrespectable person through the eyes of Ukrainian friends. What do you mean by that? Uh, unrespectable. You know, you know uh, all my Ukrainian friends said you didn't do enough to stop this war. And what did they mean by that? Where, where, uh, where, you had to see it coming. Is that what they? Mean? Uh, maybe, but they saw uh, you had the chance to uh, overthrow Putin's regime. You had a chance to be more active in protests. You had a chance uh, to stop it. So but they, equalized, you never did. they equalized Medusa with the Russian people. For sure, for sure, because we, uh, at, the, at this time, we were, and now we are uh, the biggest, unfortunately, the mm. biggest uh, independent media. Uh, and it, it's totally, understandable, acceptable, mm -hmm. and explainable mm -hmm. that they blame us mm -hmm. for, uh, for what we didn't do. That's interesting. Why, why do you find that uh, it could uh, upset you, in a sense? Because you said, hey, we've been working for eight years criticizing this government, but you, you're saying you do understand it. You know, uh, it's, it's the usual way. In Russia, there is no real... Uh, Func uh, the government uh, does not uh, do their functions. There is no uh, um, legislative, proper legislative power because mm -hmm. election was uh, faked. There is no government because government do whatever they want mm -hmm. to, but not govern. Uh, there is no court, independent court. And we have the fourth power, media. And it's totally understandable when people want media to replace other sure. uh, other government structures mm -hmm. or other other ways of power how big is your staff you're saying you you send people to the donbass uh, or to ukraine to uh, cover the war you know uh, um, comparing with other media we are small enough uh, because medusa has 64 uh, stuff, uh, including back office developers, designers, for mm. the editors, so so on. Comparing with uh, with, for example, Nova Gazeta. Mm. Nova Gazeta is twice bigger than we right. are. Right. They had 120 uh, in st uh, stuff. Uh, Vedomosti, for example, they had more than 100 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm, pe mm, people. Uh, um, so we are more or less optimized. Mm. And the, not big. 
the, the main staff or the main um, uh, office newsroom is in Latvia, is in ah, Riga. You know, uh, every time, when we started Medusa eight years ago, we <coughs> did not uh, secretly put some kind of stuff in Russia. Uh, from the very beginning, we had our correspondents, our reporters working from the ground, and we had headquarters and developers and designers and some part of news desk in Riga. Right. But uh, almost all our audience, every time when they had a chance, they asked, how could you report from the ground? You are in Riga. Yes, I was in Riga. Editor-in-chief was in Riga. Mm -hmm. Our developers was in Riga. But 27 people worked from, worked from the ground from Russia. Mm -hmm. So we had Russian office, but unfortunately, Ministry of Foreign Affairs never accepted us. Mm -hmm. They lost packages of our document for accreditation four times. <coughs> and Maria Zaharova called to our editor-in-chief and said, ah, you want to put criminals into accreditation mm -hmm. because one of our correspondents, uh, uh, correspondent, she was detained and beaten by po police during street protests and they fined her mm -hmm. for uh, 50 euros at first and 100 euros at the second time mm -hmm. despite all the documents, press, jacket, and so on. Mm. And uh, when we uh, put uh, her documents for accreditation, they called her criminal. Mm -hmm. You tried to put criminal into accreditation. They lost our package of documents four times, so we don't give it. We, do, we, we didn't care about this, and we had been working from the ground all these eight years. And when the war started and military censorship were, was imposed, we had to evacuate all of them uh, from Moscow, from uh, Minsk, from uh, uh, Novosibirsk, mm -hmm. from uh, Yekaterinburg, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to Latvia. And it was a nightmare because uh, some of them uh, have partners, mm -hmm. kids, dogs, cats, parrots, rats, rats. even ferrets. Mm -hmm. And we evacuated 27 people with all this stuff. And uh, it's my favorite, it's my favorite part. You the when our to political Riga. correspondent, Andrei Persev, he's <coughs> uh, famous, uh, and he, he saw, I obtained vi visa, I'll go to you. But how could I come to Latvia? I said, what's the problem? He said, I have four cats <sighs> and I have to cross the border by feet. Oh, yeah. How could I? <laughs> he managed. <laughs> yeah. How how could I manage four cats? Yeah, but uh, now it's in real. We managed. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess there are three. You could mark three periods. Uh, yeah. In, in, in 2014, when Medusa yeah. was founded. Yeah. Until April 21, when yeah. you were marked a foreign yeah. agent. Then the year until the war started, yeah. and then now. And I yeah. assume that it has gotten more difficult every time. What did labeling Medusa as a foreign agent, and you just explained why you think they did so, w how did that, not, did that not immediately make the work of your journalist in Moscow impossible? I know you had to label every article. It's, it, yeah. What, it's what changed? It's a tricky thing, but uh, <coughs> labeling us as a foreign agent uh, mm, wasn't so crucial as war as mm -hmm. the war is, because we were labeled as a foreign agent. But frankly, I should say thank you to the state prosecutor office, to the Russian regulator. We were the first and it, we grab all attention. Mm -hmm. It was a huge wave of support. Mm -hmm. and but you also lost advertisers. Sources. Yeah, but we lost 90% of our advertising revenue. So, so uh, yeah, in a one week. And uh, we had uh, big advertisers among Russian companies or Russian division of international companies. And uh, there was one company that revoke their, revoked their booking and even asked us to delete the name of the company mm. from every piece of content for eight years. Mm. <laughs> so they were so scary. They were so afraid. Uh, they uh, just didn't want to have problems with Kremlin. So quite a bit did change. Yeah, 
Uh, and uh, mm, but we lost some sources of information because uh, and due uh, to this reason we lost some correspondence because we had uh, not just political <coughs> correspondence but <coughs> two correspondents, two reporters who had been working with the so-called Silovik, Siloviki. Mm -hmm. uh, FSB, <coughs> police, and so on, Ministry of Interior Affairs, uh, and they just didn't pick up phones, or they said, never ever call me again, mm -hmm. you're a foreign agent. Yeah. So we lost some sources of information, but at the same time, you know, this connection between source and journalists had been, uh, had big history. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about Medusa, but it's some kind of personal connection. So we kept some of our sources, but we lost revenue and we lost our journalists because we were the first and everyone was scared. Mm -hmm. Because if uh, your company labeled as a foreign agent, it's problematic but it's not uh, so dramatic. Mm -hmm. But if you personally was labeled as a foreign agent, it could change your life forever because there is no procedure to expel you from the blacklist. You have to report every spending cup of coffee, uh, your uh, shampoo, your pair of shoes, mm -hmm. your iPhone, your bills, you have to report every three months to the Ministry of Justice wow. all your spending and all your income. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, it's, it's a torture. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a stigma and it, uh, we try to explain that this uh, status of foreign agent is a discriminating status. But <laughs> Russian authorities <laughs> told us Nothing bad happened, and unfortunately, most of our colleagues as well. Mm -hmm. They said, please put these 24 ugly words in every piece of content and everything will be okay. But now, uh, this month, State Duma imposed a law that restricted rights of foreign agents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have no right to teach. You have no right even to read lectures mm -hmm. publicly. You have no right to be elected and even to be an observer during the elections. So there are uh, huge restrictions for foreign agent. It's the next step. I, I, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Well, I guess that, that makes it impossible to, to work in um, Russia and at the same time, even though you pulled out your yeah. journalist officially, I'm sure you still have ears and eyes on the ground. Yeah. You have journalists there, they just don't get a byline? They don't get their names underneath the article? Unfortunately, we had to change our code of practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, because previously, at previous years, uh, to work anonymously, it was strictly forbidden in Medusa. Mm -hmm. We uh, worked openly. Uh, always a name. Always underneath the, the article. name. And uh, it was strictly <coughs> forbidden to use nicknames. Anonymous and sources now, also, yeah, I mean. Okay. And anonymous sources mm. as well. If we put anonymous sources into the article, editor-in-chief and editor of the article knows for sure Who all are. the information. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, but now we changed this rule because uh, there are a um, grave threat, vital threat for them, for mm. our sources of information. Mm -hmm. Because according to the new laws, even gathering information about the situation in the Russian army, in the Russian economy, in the Russian political situation could lead you to the prison. And it's up to 15 years in prison. So is it still worth it um, to have some eyes and ears on the ground? They cannot call the war a war because they have to call it a military operation. <laughs> um, uh, or not because you... Uh, we are Latvian yeah, uh, media. Yeah. So uh, from the very beginning, we... Uh, uh, wrote an editorial and we called the war yeah, the war right. and all this stuff. But they uh, can still hardly uh, yeah, don't, but don't pick up the phones. Yeah, 
Yeah, some of them, mm -hmm. for sure. So is it still worth it to but have people Yeah, there? but you know, it's a very strange thing. Uh, uh, now it's nine months of the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last three months, we see <coughs> the growing sources of information from inside Kremlin and growing. inside Russian government structures. So it seems to me that they are in doubt because they realized that they are failing. Right and when now. did this change? When, when did your journalists after start after uh, after mobilization and after the counter uh, counter attack of uh, Ukrainian forces? They got fed yeah, more yeah, information yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Does that give you? Um, does that make you hopeful? Ah. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm not a military specialist, but I hope mm. that uh, maybe some guys inside uh, behind the Kremlin war started to accept reality. <coughs> because uh, very first half of the year, I was sure that they are insane. Absolutely, totally, all of them. Mm. I want to talk about something that happened recently, um, uh, which is about TV rain. Yep. Um, I, uh, Dost, how do you? Dost. Dost. TV rain is easier. Um, uh, which is also um, uh, an independent uh, media station operating yep. from Latvia as well, but they are no longer uh, welcome there. The, the, the backstory is that a presenter at TV rain was on air uh, expressing hope that Russian soldiers in Ukraine would get enough supplies. And there were some other incidents. Um, I think they showed a map of Russia, including Crimea, Crimea. which made the Latvians very upset. Um, and they basically, you know, they, they kicked TV Rain out of the country. Um, Medusa gave out a statement in support of TV Rain. G can you discuss that? Can you talk about why Latvia, in your opinion, was wrong doing so? Uh, you know, uh all these years, I was absolutely and totally against all bans. Even RT. I'm, I was against the banning <coughs> of RT in Russia TV because, you know, this Barbara Streisand effect. I personally do not know any person who are watching RT in Latvia who had been watching RT. You have to explain to me the Barbara Streisand effect. They have no audience, in, had no audience in Latvia. But since they were banned, this ban attract, mm -hmm. uh, grab attention mm -hmm. uh, of the audience. They say, oh, they prohibit, they banned the RT. Let's see what, mm. what on what earth... It? What is it? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's some kind of advertising. It right. was some kind of advertising of RT. Uh, the first. The second, I totally understand that uh, the reaction of Latvia. Latvia has the biggest Russian-speaking population among Baltic states. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, for 20 years, uh, Russian speaking population was left alone with the Russian TV because Estonia has this ETV for Russian speaking mm -hmm. audience. Lithuania um, has no problems with Russian speaking because they have only 9% <coughs> of the population uh, um, um, speaking Russian. So, and Latvia, who has almost 30%. Mm -hmm. of populations uh, 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 Russian, they uh, cancelled broadcasting in Russian and Russians were left alone with the state propaganda from Russian state TV. Mm -hmm. So, but there are still, they have big border with Russia, uh, with Russia. they have this Russian speaking population, they have uh, more or less popular pro-Russian parties inside their parliament. So they are very much concerned. So it's understandable. But because I do not think yeah. that revoking of license is the solution. After one mistake or uh, by the presenter, one, three, well, a couple, three, but they apologize. Uh, they, it seems to me that the, uh, the government could act more wisely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to explain, 
Uh, speaking about Dost, I'm very sorry for them and they're our colleagues, but there is one thing I could not explain to TV Rain journalists. You could not transfer the product mm -hmm. to the other ground without any change. Right. You are in different country, in different position. Mm -hmm. You have different audience with different views. And as I used to say, the writer, the author could write for God and for himself, mm -hmm. but journalist works for his audience. Mm -hmm. You have to uh, put an attention to whom mm -hmm. are you speaking and to uh, get some agreement with audience to be very um, to be very polite to be uh, independent mm -hmm. but not rude right. you know so not to n n not to disturb your audience in a such harsh way Given the fact that you're both uh, uh, independent media, critical of, 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 of the Kremlin, but every news organization, just like every human being, can make, can make a mistake. Absolutely. Do you feel less safe now in, in Latvia? Not physically safe, but as a news organization? Actually, yes. Uh, after uh, a TV Rain license was revoked, we spent the night searching for mistakes <laughs> in Medusa articles. How many did you found find? Found two. What were they? Uh, one was a, a map with the border of Ukraine, and there was some empty place in the line of border. It was just a technical problem. Okay, yeah. so you solved it. Yeah, and the next we uh, called Crimea not annexed, but joined with Russia. Mm. So you changed that too? Yeah. But does it also mean that you, because we, we spoke before and you said that you were thinking about, you know, expanding mm -hmm. or, or lo relocating some of the staff to other places, perhaps Amsterdam as well? You know, uh, this scandal with the TV rain could affect us as well, because uh, almost all journalists who left Russia, they obtained humanitarian visa D. Mm -hmm. And they will ex be expired at March 2023. So maybe in three months, Latvia, they have this right not to prolong mm -hmm. these visas. So uh, I, uh, I didn't spoke yet with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. and with the Immig Immigration Office. Uh, I will do it next week mm -hmm. and I'll try to negotiate and to come to agreement because mm -hmm. Latvia promised to be a safe harbor for journalists, mm -hmm. but we never promised not to make mistakes. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll try to negotiate with them, but uh, I feel a threat mm -hmm. that our visa could expire it and no solution will, uh, will be made. Some organizations like, like TV Rain mm -hmm. or part of TV Rain is in Amsterdam, and so is the Moscow yeah. Times. Um, would this be a good place for Medusa to work from uh, as well? You know, uh, we want to stay in Riga, mm -hmm. but we realized that we could not count <coughs> on, at the only one government. So we started one year ago, we started this project mm -hmm. called Cloud Medusa mm -hmm. to establish one unit, uh, to keep one unit in Riga and to establish two more units, one in Berlin, one in Amsterdam. Because Riga is one of my favorite cities. Mm -hmm. I love Riga very much. It's one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And I call it, I'm awfully sorry, architectural porn. Because <laughs> if, if you are staying at the crossroads and, saw the, and see these masterpieces, mm. it's so beautiful and I adore Riga. Mm. But Riga is too small to be safe. 200 Russian journalists came to Riga. If I go shopping, I usually say hi 
not less than 10 times at one street. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely visible. Mm -hmm. So Riga is, is too small to be mm -hmm. safe. So we decided that we could organize clouds of Medusa mm -hmm. like cloud structure. Yeah, yeah. If some, something bad happens, with happened with uh, one cloud, the other could continue job, mm -hmm. our job. Uh, how how uh, annoying does the how, how much of a pain in the butt are you for the Kremlin right now, Medusa? Uh, you uh, know, do you have any idea, or do they just you know, don't care uh, anymore? Uh, from my perspective, they are pretty busy now with the Ukrainians. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. Uh, not us, mm. but. Previously, they are they were very much concerned because, according to our sources, when we were labeled as a foreign agent, the decision was made at the meeting of Security Council of the country. For God's sake, we are just Latvian media. Mm -hmm. Security Council of Great Russia decided to put us uh, into the blacklist. That by number one, afraid of you. and right. according to our sources, <coughs> it was Margarita Simanian, head of RT, uh, who brought this list to the Security Council meeting, mm -hmm. and she was uh, mentioned us as a number one. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, they were very much concerned, and. Uh, uh, we made some investigation and published it uh, about RT, and um, they established special desk uh, inside RT, and their main task was to copycat Medusa's formats mm -hmm. and Medusa's tone of voice. And the head of this desk was the youngest son of uh, Kremlin. PR guy, Alexei Gromov. Alexei Gromov Jr. Mm -hmm. was in charge of this desk, mm -hmm. but they failed. Mm -hmm. They are not smart enough to uh, replicate us. As I said, if we go back to the beginning, Medusa was founded in 2014 yep. in, 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 in Latvia, uh, which was obviously a crucial year when the Donbass war started yep. and Crimea was, was, was taken. Um, was the taking of Crimea the was that what made you initiate Medusa? Uh, Why no, was Medusa I needed? was just thrown out from my previous job. No, no, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So it was uh, uh, mm, 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 the owner of uh, Lentaru uh, fired me in uh, maybe 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, then I grabbed my. Uh, two boxes of pictures and uh, some notebooks and so on, and so on. Uh, put it into my car and, and just uh, go away. Mm -hmm. Say thank you and go away. <clears throat> and uh, I spent three days with my uh, schoolmates in Budapest, crying in this huge pool with thermal water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and then I returned to Moscow and called to my friend and deputy Ivan Kolpakov, who is now <coughs> editor-in-chief of Medusa. And Ivan said, where, where are you? I, I said, I'm in the airport. He said, uh, please go through our office and we will, we, will, we will meet. And my taxi just stopped and two of my deputies uh, um, um, meet me. And uh, then we uh, sat in my apartment, drink a lot for sure. <laughs> and that always helps. Yeah, it always helps. Uh, and I said, guys, what should we do? Let's start our own lives or let's do something insane. And Ivan said, we had tiny chance to make media as we want to. Mm -hmm. by ourselves. Let's try. Mm -hmm. Because if don't, don't, we will remember that we had a chance but didn't use it. Mm -hmm. So we tried and that's all. And magically Medusa's destiny is very much uh, connected with Ukraine. I was uh, fired because of Ukraine and Medusa was founded because of Ukraine war and now 
What, what was the reason for you being fired? What reason did they give you? Uh, uh, they said, uh, you are number one in the Russian internet. We were number one. Mm -hmm. uh, you have three million users per day. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, it's almost first channel of state TV uh, comparing audience. Yeah. But you are not under control. And Kremlin just ordered to fire me to mm -hmm. the owner. Mm -hmm. And the owner said, I have no cards to play with Kremlin. Mm -hmm. I have to fire you. When Medusa started in 14 and, and the years after, did you feel uh, hurt in the West as well? You obviously had an audience in, 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 in Russia. Uh, um, from the very beginning, um, uh, we said that we do not want to be involved in Western agenda. Mm -hmm. We are working for people uh, inside Russia and we said that we want to prove uh, the idea that you could uh, develop, build and develop popular media outside Moscow right. because Russia is so centralized. Yeah. Everything happens in Moscow and nothing happens, happens in regions. We are uh, sitting in small Riga and we wanted to prove that you could be Mm. Uh, actual popular sitting outside of Moscow. Mm. And what do, do, you, do you know exactly what your reach within Russia is right now? And and how do people read Medusa with all the? Uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, at the fourth of March, we were blocked. Mm. Our desktop and mobile version were blocked in Russia. But as I used to say we had a disaster scenarios. Before the war started, we started a huge promo campaign. We asked Proton Mail to provide us a VPN free of charge for our readers. So we've got four VPN services for uh, our readers. We developed the fifth one. It was our own in-home, in-house VPN. So we started uh, the promo campaign, download VPN. Mm -hmm. Then we upgraded our mobile application and now it has five built-in mechanism of bypassing blocking. Mm -hmm. And they switched one to another. Uh, if one mm, doesn't work, it switched to another. So it works inside Russia perfectly well. So everybody who wants to read yeah, Medusa can yeah, do so. Yeah, you can download mobile application mm -hmm. and everything is okay. And we started to develop platforms, Telegram channel, and we have more than 1 million subscribers mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Telegram channel. And even Facebook, Facebook was labeled as an extremist organization right. uh, in, inside Russia. But even Facebook uh, shows growth. Uh, Instagram, the most popular and uh, we have two email newsletter. Uh, one has uh, <coughs> 68 sub thousand subscribers, another 120 wow. uh, thousand subscribers. So, and uh, all these measures uh, um, gave us the results because even now we are blocked, but since uh, Putin declared mobilization, we had pre-war numbers even at desktop. Wow. For example, uh, at uh, September and October, even desktop shows 12 million unique users mm. per month. So there are millions of people in Russia who uh, desperately need... And do you hear from them? Do, they, do, they, do you get feedback, emails, etc.? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm and, sure and, you do. What, what, I, what in general? I, I, I start to cry every time when I talk about this because... Uh, uh, not every month, but uh, when we started crowdfunding campaign inside Russia one year ago, every month, me and Devan, we wrote letters to our n donators. Mm -hmm. Talking about our news, what we're going to do, about our feelings. And uh, this autumn we wrote a letter and asked them, guys, we saw the decline uh, in page views of the news. Mm -hmm. Do you stop reading news for real and I asked our com community manager to make a file with the one phrase from every uh, answer and he gave me a file of 43 pages wow. 
and it was just one uh, one phrase from every letter and all of them said guys we love you mm. we do need you but we are so tired of bad news we promise you to read you but be ca- be, be patient we just uh, have so bad feelings about this war mm. so and it was a huge way of love and i start crying every time when i talk about this because <clears throat> according to google analytics uh we still have up to 18% of our readers in ukraine wow and you know in ukraine there are a lot of russian speaking uh people so they wrote us and it's uh, absolutely heartbreaking because they said guys just go on we want to read you mm-hmm. we understand what is happening and we do not blame you and we are reading you there is a uh, problems with electricity but we charge our phone and we read you from the wow. bomb, bomb shelter wow. yeah, yeah I start, I start crying because mm-hmm. russian bombs uh, are falling on their head and they read meduz in russian mm. yeah. Yeah, that, that gives you an, an yeah. incentive to go on and on, obviously. Yeah. 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 Uh, but me and the one we used to, uh, hey, please don't ask me what for. We are doing this. You do not like the answer <laughs> because we do not know. No, uh, but now you it's know. just a job to be done. Yeah. yeah, but now you know what you're doing it for, yeah. obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, w- w- so many people in Russia and Ukraine, but yeah. Russia also still fortunately read, read what you write. Um, when we think about the opposition in Russia, mm-hmm. we don't see many people out on the street for yeah. understandable reasons because you end up in jail yeah. or you could end up in jail. Many yeah. people have and left we'll the country. Be or t- yeah, will be tortured. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that also makes it very hard to estimate um, how big the opposition is, how m- how many Russians are basically numb and just want this to be over with. Um, some obviously are worried about their family members yeah. fighting in, in, in Ukraine. Some are also supportive of uh, Putin, and it's not a small group. Sure. Um, is it? Can you make an estimation of the size of the what could be considered the opposition in Russia? No, I have just one indicator. According to our sources, more than million people left Russia since the war started. Mm-hmm. It's a huge number, mm-hmm. you know, and we have our readers, for sure we have haters, but most of our readers, they share our views and values, mm-hmm. and they express it in Instagram, in Telegram, and so on. Mm-hmm. So, we, uh, um, maybe, maybe I have the reasonable reason, the, the reason to estimate it not less than 10, 15 million. Mm-hmm. Because I know for sure, for example, a uh, um, couple months ago, I met my friend. She's a managing director of Charity Foundation. And she said, I'm inside Russia. What could I do? I have my mother. She's 83. Mm-hmm. I have my father. He's 87. Mm-hmm. And I have the father of my uh, cousin, mm-hmm. he is 80. Mm. I could not leave them. No. So I have to take care about them. So I'm inside Russia. And it seems to me that there are a lot of people inside mm. Russia who are totally against the war, but they have no possibility to express themselves. Mm. Because if she came to the street, she will be arrested and who will take care about mm. this, uh, her parents and seniors and so on. And this will not f- in the near future change. So these 10 to 15 million people, let's assume you're right. But it's you know, great, I guess, that they're opposing the war. It's just, there's just not much use you know, in it. You know, the that trick sounds too cynical, but you yeah, know what I mean. But you know, the trick is that uh, the opposition movement was beheaded one year ago With when Navalny Alexei Navalny yeah. was put behind bars mm-hmm. and they tortured him every day because uh, now he spent three months in a mm-hmm. solitary confinement. 
So the crackdown on the yeah, media and the yeah. opposition work. And Vladimir Karamurzai, he is not very influential, but he's very smart guy. Who? He's Sorry? very br Vladimir Karamurza. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Ilya Yashin was put behind bars and Recently. the opposition movement was beheaded because yeah. Navalny was the most successful politician. He established more than 100 uh, mm, desks or departments Office. all across yeah. offices, yeah. all across the, car yeah. the country. Yeah. Uh, but they destroyed uh, um, all the movements. So mm. there is no... Uh, Re opposition, p uh, political opposition mm. movement in Russia at all. There are just desperate people mm. who are trying to survive. There was an event here in the Bali uh, last October and mm -hmm. your colleague Ivan Kolpakov mm -hmm. was yeah. here, the editor-in-chief yeah. of Medusa. You were invited as well, but you, um, you, you had to cancel for good reason because you were accepting the um, yeah. European Journalist of the Year Award yeah. in, in Potsdam. Yeah. Um, but you left a video message, yep. uh, a brief video message saying, uh, among other things, one day Russia will be free. Yeah, it's uh, the favorite slogan of Alexei Navalny. Mm. And uh, we used to add, uh, Russia, one day Russia will be free and Latvia will be happy. <laughs> Latvia will be happy. Yeah, yeah. And Latvia will well, be was it Was it yeah. wishful thing? I mean, take us to that day, that one day that Russia be, will be free. I mean, what, what needs, needs to happen? I, I, um, does Putin's future, in De your sense, uh, defeat de uh, mm. the defeat? Russia defeat definitely, in Ukraine. definitely need a, needs a defeat because that to realize to accept the reality. Because that will mean a defeat. Stop Putin. being great country. Be just country for your people. Defeat in Ukraine would mean Putin's gone. You mean? Maybe, maybe, hmm. maybe. And what would defeat in Ukraine mean? I mean, what, when, when would, um, would you know, you know, even losing the Donbass and, and Crimea be uh, considered a uh, you or know, back to the borders uh, of know, February 24? The strange thing is that Putin could declare victory in any time because he is a natural born liar. Mm -hmm. So he could declare whatever he wants to. Would the but, people in Russia buy yeah, it? But, I mean. but it seems to me that uh, it's not a very popular idea. But Kremlin is not homogenic. It's not what? Gomogenic. Right. <laughs> or right. not the same. No. Every person from prime minister, uh, he is a very pragmatical person, mm -hmm. uh, to Ministry of Economic, to uh, all these guys, they could play their own game, mm -hmm. but until Putin is in the power, they have no chance to. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe some pragmatic guys could take the power of the Putin. Mm. And it's my only hope. I guess we don't know what, what's going on behind the walls of the Kremlin. You yeah. just said that your journalists, you know, people start picking up the phone more, which yeah. may be an indication that... Yeah. You know, there's, there's some and kind there of unrest. And there are some changes because, for example, we published an article that there will be some changes in, pre in Kremlin administration. Putin just wanted to replace persons who are in charge of foreign affairs. In yeah, there was a, a rumor that uh, I saw that today that Lavrov may be replaced. Uh, foreign minister or... Nothing. No, I, I do not know about no. Lavrov. I, uh, it was uh, some <coughs> sources that... Uh, said that people inside Kremlin administration, not official government, mm -hmm. but the shadow government, Kremlin administration, will be fired right. and replaced by others. Yeah. So just he's not so sure. <laughs> just two or three more questions about Russia and the West, and then I want to give everybody here the chance to ask a question to you as well. Um, how do, uh, it's too broad of a question, but I would say, how, how do Russians, how do you believe Russians um, look at the West right now. Um, uh, let, let's no. say your readers, because Russians is, is our but readers. your readers, those those who oppose this war, no. they um, see us, the West, providing weapons to Ukraine endlessly. Uh, I have no right to speak in the name of all my audience, but I understand. as far as I could describe the situation, most of our readers are western oriented people they are tolerant they are uh, no 
almost everything about human rights and they realize what is happening right now because Putin just throw back country to the 50, uh, 50 years back. He just throw country 50 years back. Yeah. We're in somewhere in Brezhnev's era. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, those old guys with the uh, mm, glass, uh, with the glasses, uh, uh, who uh, doesn't know how to use internet. Mm. Uh, but we have the most, the youngest uh, audience among Russian independent media. So <coughs> as uh, uh, far as I could describe, they are, uh, their hope is that uh, West and Western countries uh, do not uh, picture them in uh, white and black mm -hmm. colors. Yeah. That they are different. And um, speaking about others, actually, I do not know this audience of Russian state TV. No. I just do not know nothing about them. You mentioned Russia Today earlier. And yeah. um, Russia Today, I think even in the Netherlands, I'm not even sure. I think in the Netherlands also, it's they got it off the cable, I believe, mm -hmm. in many Western European countries. Um, do you consider that a smart idea? You could also argue that, you know, it's good for our audience to see and hear and, and read what the um, what the Russians, the pro-Putin Russians get, get fed. Yeah, maybe. But uh, when somebody asks me, do you want RT to be banned? I said, no. Right. Please do better because uh, one day uh, my colleague from uh, one investigative project asked me why Medusa is so harsh why I am so disturbing mm. I say please do better yeah. yeah please do your job better than we do right you could not so I'm sorry so and if you see RT please do the best shows. Then they're Be no risk. better than they yeah. are. Yeah. So that's all. That's the only solution. Yeah, and, what, what? And, and let your audience, it's the sign of respect for your audience mm -hmm. to let them choose. Mm -hmm. Finally... smart enough to, to, <laughs> to choose properly. Yeah. Finally, European countries in, in general made it harder for Russians yeah. to get a visa for Europe. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the idea behind it is also that they will start blaming their own government in Moscow for, yeah. for, for that. Um, how do you look at that, the, the visa ban uh, for Russians that want to no, go to uh, Amsterdam? For I have this example uh, of Latvian Minister of Foreign Affairs. I respect him very much. He's a very good guy and very smart guy. But he said, I respect those who left Russia after the war started, and I do not respect those who left Russia after uh, mobilization uh, was declared. But, you know, those persons who left Russia after Putin declared mobilization, just, just think about it, they left their home country not to be murderers, right. not to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. And it's a choice. Mm -hmm. It's I respect them mm -hmm. very much. So it seems to me that, and most of them, even my journalists, you know, journalists are so light-minded. For a year, I repeatedly say, guys, you have to have two passports, one with you and one at your friend's house. Not uh, at your parents' house, but at your friend's house. Mm -hmm. Two passports, visas, so on. So when the war started, 14 of them did not have a second passport and 14 of them didn't have any visa at all. <laughs> and it's Journalists usual. are so uh, stubborn. Yeah, yeah. And, and most of people who left Russia, they left Russia f forever, but with a tourist visa. Mm -hmm. right. they, have, oh, they had open visa, mm -hmm. so they used it mm -hmm. just to left to leave the country. Thank you. I'm sure there are questions from um, our audience. And yeah. Maybe. That tool has the microphone. Maybe not. <laughs> I'm sure there are. Otherwise, Maybe I'll not. start pointing yeah. to people. Yeah. 
Uh, hello, my name is Ekaterina. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, you said that uh, you don't know the audience who watch the Bro Kremlin um, TV, but um, don't you think um, it's your responsibility as a journalist who writes in Russian um, to reach also these people and to make them, I don't know, question maybe or have them um, diversify um, what they watch and what they hear? Um, and maybe the the journalist from the TV rain, maybe it was not his mistake, but maybe he also wanted to address these people. For sure, for sure. But you know, I'm a real, uh, I'm a pragmatic and realistic person because I'm a publisher. I have to count money and sources. I just have no source. I have millions of my devoted readers. I have to serve it, to to give them our content and I just have no money and sources to think about those people who are under propaganda. If I have additional sources, for sure I will try. I'm very uh, much energetic about this, but let's be realistic. I was at the age of survival one year ago. I lost all revenue. I lost a third of my team. I just have no sources to grab their attention. If the, if the situation changed, for sure I'll try to convert them, them. But not now. We are on the age of survival. Thank It's you. It's not my intention. I do not uh, to put them aside. But we just in the very difficult uh, situation. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak more about your relationship to the Russian-speaking community in Latvia. Uh, before the war started, back in January, in Estonia, definitely, uh, the, the attitude of the local authorities was, we want to be the place where you can be a free Russia speaker, where you can where you can have a Russian-speaking community that has access to all of the information in the world, that can, that can make free political choices. And it seems as though that vision of a of the Baltic states mm -hmm. as a place where there's a spillover between Ruski Mir and the rest of the world is impossible now because of the polarization. Uh, but is that true? Is there still a space to sort of build links? You know, uh, uh, I can describe Latvia as a country of two minorities because Latvian Latvians consider themselves as a minority, but they are majority. And Russians consider themselves as a minority and the most troubled minority, humiliated minority. So there are a lot of, um, not conflict, but a lot of tension between two parts of the society. And uh, speaking about Russian population, they were left for sure with Russian state TV alone. And uh, it's a bad habit to quote taxi drivers <laughs> and other, uh, for example, uh, guys from uh, uh, services, of car services and so on. But uh, I used to hear the opinion that in Russia there is very strong leader and there are all, everything is okay. I say, have you ever been to Russia? No. They have no chance to compare TV picture with the picture they see from their window. Uh, audience inside Russia has this chance to compare pictures. But Russians in Latvia, they are dreaming of perfect country with a strong leader nearby. They, so it's some kind of dream homeland. So, uh, and most of them, unfortunately, are under influence of Russian state TV. And uh, some Le uh, Russian speaking uh, Latvians, they had a hard feelings for me because once I said 
that when I go to the uh, Riga main uh, market, I hear this tone of voice from Russian TV. You know, it's a very rude uh, tone of voice. What? Yeah, something like this. And they, they expressed hard feelings. They say, we are not the same. We are from Riga. We are all very polite people. But I could hear it. And it's all from state TV. Now it is banned. But you have YouTube. You have other options to hear. And there is no Russian language broadcasting in Latvian TV. So the situation is not so good, unfortunately. And I read Russian language print newspapers in Riga uh, cafes. Awful. Awful. So outdated. It's all from 90s. And those magazines, how to attract your husband. <laughs> Guys, we're in 2022. How to wear heels properly. Where are you from? From 80s, 70s, 60s, something like this. So it's so outdated. <laughs> Not a good quality, unfortunately. I'm sorry to say this. Yeah. Thank you. Over here, yeah. <coughs> oh. <laughs> um, hi, yeah, my name is Valeria. I have a question. Uh, can you maybe share your vision uh, of uh, the future of Medusa, maybe like in the best case scenario? Hmm. Oh, best. Oh, 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 it's the toughest question I ever heard. <laughs> the best scenario. I am not so good in the best and the worst scenario. May I, may I uh, just uh, uh, tell, uh, tell you about uh, our development team. I adore them and they are great developers and great technical specialists. And they said, let us develop uh, bad scenarios. I say, okay. And they came to me and said, maybe you will be in a bad mood because we have a uh, bad scenario, worst scenario, catastrophic scenario, and deadly scenario. I said, okay, let's sh show me. <laughs> and then they show me all the scenarios and all plan how to survive. And I say, guys, uh, you missed just one part. In... Uh, uh, medicine, uh, doctors call it uh, combined trauma. Uh, there is no uh, point of death in your scenarios. You have to analyze what could kill us. So, uh, and they had bad mood. <laughs> and they were so much disappointed that I, I was happy. But speaking about happy scenario, happy scenario is uh, the same, that we could uh, get enough money from Western crowdfunding and we started uh, new platforms. For example, we started YouTube because it was not our cup of tea. Uh, video products, so we uh, we could start YouTube. Uh, we uh, could um, strengthen other platforms, uh, and maybe it's it's my dream. I I'm going to visit Silicon Valley and to talk with uh, big tech to help us to unblock internet within Russia. Mm to help us find the solution. Because according to my sources, when Russian regulator tried to block Telegram, Pavel Durov, the owner of Telegram, he was not alone. He came to the Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and said, guys, please help me. And he was not alone who, fight, uh, who, who had been fighting against a uh, Russian regulator. And they helped him. So I am... Uh, my dream is that they could consider uh, the situation and maybe they could help us to unblock internet within Russia. Mm. Yeah. Good question. 
Yep. And what would it take eventually for you to go back to Russia? Um, but uh, I do not know when they uh, revoke all these insane laws because. Uh, me and Ivan, we counted that now we could be prosecuted under <coughs> 12 or 13 articles of criminal code. Mm. So we are uh, criminal persons. Mm. So, so, no. <laughs> not, not now. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yeah. Were there more questions yeah. from the audience? Or yeah, in the back. Yeah. This is a quite a tough question, but uh, you mentioned contacts within Russia and I imagine the Kremlin too. What do you see, because you mentioned also that uh, Putin should lose the war in the Ukraine. Um, you after that, you gave a rather optimistic view of what would happen next. And I'm wondering, because I talked to quite a few people that said this could mean the end of Russia as we know it. How, what do you see as possible scenarios after that? And what also would allow for the end of the war in the Ukraine? Uh, tough questions. Hopefully, you can give some uh, uh, Russian insights. Do you yeah. mean uh, the situation inside Russia? Yeah, yeah exactly. Because some yeah, people say you know, it's at uh, the end of the Russia as we know it. Uh, you know, uh, I do not believe that Russia could split into different countries. Uh, what uh, <coughs> could I say that maybe? maybe some regional leaders or some big regions will try to uh, separate from Russia. For example, Russian North or Russian Far East, but it seems to me that there is no reason to Russia to uh, split for uh, um, several countries. And uh, if, you know, my main idea is Russia had bad uh, equipment for army, uh, very poor population, bad army. Even those uh, uh, spies, Salisbury, uh, uh, this uh, Salisbury... Skripal. Yeah, yeah Skrip uh, Skripal situation. They are all bad students. <laughs> Why do we think that they are good at spying or at some kind of uh, secret uh, plans? They are bad educated, <laughs> badly educated, and they are not so smart as we think. So I presume that maybe, maybe the smartest of them will take power. According to my view, it's Mr. Mishustin, our prime minister. He's a smart guy. Or maybe some guys from technical departments, like Alexei Kudrin or something like this. But not those tough guys, like uh, head of army and now Suravikin, who is just a butcher. He's not a smart guy because as I used to say, that the victory belongs to the smartest, not to the biggest. Mm -hmm. So I hope that maybe, maybe pragmatical and smart guy, guys will uh, um, win this race for Putin's place. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one or two more. Mm -hmm. If there are yeah. any, there are two more. Yeah. These two. <laughs> Hi there. Um, Hi. So my, my partner's Russian, um, originally she's Dutch now. Um, and what always surprises me when I talk to her is that when we talk about the current situation or her growing up in the 90s, she's a child of the late 80s, um, she's not even really angry anymore. It's like all the anger is gone out of her completely and it's more that all that remains is apathy. Mm. And the same is true for her friends. They're all like part of sort of this left-wing intelligentsia, right? Mm. They all live quite happily in the West. But where I feel like I'm at least hopeful that if something like what's happening in Russia would happen here, that I would sort of rage and rebel in the streets. Mm -hmm. They're all like, well, it's all the same. It's never going to change. It's all shit. Navalny, he's probably shit too. Maybe just another shade of shit. But... It, it, there's no optimism, you know, it's, and, and this is supposed to be a generation that, yeah, that, that sort of saves Russia, if you will, and then sort of brings it into the, 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 the global order. But why is that? 
Uh, you are exp uh, asking her to explain your wife, right? <laughs> Yeah, oh, you know. Sorry. <laughs> I, I've tried. I've tried desperately, <coughs> tried desperately uh, over uh, the years to understand <laughs> the depths of that woman. But um, <laughs> no, I, I, it's a great I, What I'm asking you yeah. is for context around where is the rage? There is no no anger. Not about this, at least anymore. It's just apathy. It's like mm. this acceptance that it'll never change. Uh, the anger uh, well, uh, is born when you see the possibility mm. and uh, the option. Russians uh, last 10 years could not see any option. Mm. They had a hope for Navalny, but Navalny is in prison. They had some hope for so-called snow revolution, but snow revolution was uh, ruined and destroyed. <coughs> so. You are in a huge emotion, in a very energetic position when you have the alternative. You have something to fight for, but it's a burnt field. You could not see any possibility of changes. So the apathy, apathy was born in these circumstances and some kind of learned helplessness. And if there were just a small light of hope or some shadow of alternative, the rage will burn for sure, because there will be a hope. Now it's no hope at all. They just could not see it. And that's all. Was that satisfying? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, it was a great question. There, over here, oh, over here? Yeah. Well, let's finish them all. Yeah. Mm. So, a lot of my Ukrainian friends are condemning the Russians who are fleeing from Russia because they say if there is going to be uh, opposition, it has to be from within Russia. Um, do you think it's realistic that there would be an op opposition from outside of Russia? Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, I agree with your Ukrainian friends, unfortunately, because, you know, from outside, there is uh, no hope. Uh, we, uh, the even Lenin and Bolsheviks, they had to return to Russia to make revolution. There is no possibility to organize some changes, changes from outside, definitely. And it seems to me that that's the reason. Navalny, Karamurza, and Yashin returned to Russia and they just met their destiny in prison, but they realized that the changes could uh, be p possible only from inside. But it doesn't mean that those people who left Russia uh, doesn't matter, eight years ago as I did, or eight months or eight days ago, uh, doesn't mean that they, uh, their efforts are not valuable. They, maybe they are saving their lives and their minds and their conscience. So it's respectful. It's, it need, uh, we do need to respect their choice. Mm. They are free people and they made this tough choice. Because, For example, eight years ago, I realized that Kremlin never ever allowed me to start new media inside Russia. And I said, guys, I'm too tired and too old to start from the scratch inside Russia. I have no energy and power to fight with FSB, policemen, uh, tax, um, um, tax service, uh, fire service, and all this stuff. I just want to do my job properly and honestly. So I left Russia eight years ago. But it doesn't mean that it's not uh, that uh, me or other people does not deserve the respect. 
we made our choice. It's not an easy choice, actually, because the last time I was in Moscow two and a half years ago, and it was like <laughs> uh, I came from the taxi, and it was rain, and uh, uh, every blossom was here, and it was spring, and I start crying because it's my home. And since the war started, I live with my two bags between Riga, Berlin, Amsterdam, Riga, Berlin, Amsterdam, and I have uh, these sneakers and one pair of shoes with me because I just could not <laughs> catch uh, this. And with the one suitcase, it's okay. Uh, as uh, one of uh, Russian poets said, everything is okay, but unfortunately, they stole country from us and they stole our past from us. Uh, I uh, made an example that one of my favorite uh, stand-ups was at YouTube. American uh, actor said, Russian are Russians are scary. When I'm in a criminal neighborhood, I pretend to be Russian and said, what? What else? And I laughed. Now, I could not because Russians are scary. You know, I, they even stole jokes from us. Not, not country, not, ho uh, not only country, home, friends, uh, concerts, meetings, exhibitions, all this communication, they stole even jokes from us. Even our movies we love to, 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 to um, see. It's not so easy. Yeah. Are there any other yeah. questions? Yeah. One in front, right? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, has it uh, has it ever occurred to you that the Russian gov government would try to kidnap you and your journalist, just like what Lukashenko did to Roman Protasevich, for example? Uh, no, they just followed me in my apartment. Uh, I RT published the my address of my apartment, and I started to receive suspicious envelopes or some parcels. In Riga. In Riga, yeah, they published the address of my apartment, and they followed me at the streets and shooting me <coughs> and trying to provoke me to make me angry. And I said, guys, I just do not want to talk to you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Get back. Sorry, I just do not want to talk to you. Get back, and something like this. But uh, uh, last year uh, we planned to visit Perugia um, Journalistic Festival. It's the biggest journalistic event in the world. Very useful. And we refused due to the security reasons because it's a big city and it's thousands of people and they could do whatever they want to. And we have very bad experience with Nova Gazeta journalists who were poisoned and, and so on. So we just, and we try, me and Devan, we try not to travel together <laughs> and not to be at the same city at, at, at one time, uh, at the same time. So, Great question as yeah, well. I think we you. have to um, uh, leave it at this, but yeah. I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody when I wish you uh, well with Medusa and um, Thank you. with this journey. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm.